Please welcome our panelists. Marina Gorbis, Executive Director for the Institute for the Future. Writer Karen Lord. Writer Elizabeth Baer. And our moderator, Gideon Litchfield, Editor-in-Chief, MIT Technology Review. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I hope you've had an inspiring couple of days. Uh, Solve is all about imagination, and uh, science fiction writers are some of the people who fuel the imagination of technologists and solvers and people who create the future more than anyone. And so we have a wonderful panel here with two writers and one futurist who is also a writer. And there is a good question of, where, is there really a difference between what Marina does and Karen and Elizabeth do? We'll, we'll come to that discussion. But um, I thought I would start out with a question for the three of you, which is, um, if science fiction has often been about, is often about dystopia, and about painting the future in terrible colors. In the latest uh, issue of MIT Technology Review, which is about climate change, we have a, a story by the writer Paolo Bacigalopi about what America looks like 20 years from now uh, under the effects of climate change. It's a great story, but it's horrifying. <laughs> it's very dystopian. Um, and neither of you two, I think, are particularly dystopian writers. Um, but so. Can you talk a little bit about how you think of the role of what you do in inspiring um, visions of the future? Karen, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> well, um, it's interesting when you're talking about dystopia. I do think that one, one aspect of what we do is perhaps is a little bit of warning. When you're doing a story, you, you tend to do so much research. And, you, and especially if you're doing something that is linked intimately with what we're doing in the present. Um, you are looking at journal articles, you are looking at um, newspaper um, reports, and you are, you're, you're connecting the dots in ways that some people may not be. So you do hope that it's a bit of a warning. But a warning can also be an inspiration. It can be a hope. It can be a, oh, look at this cool technology. What if somebody did this with it and, and, and solved this problem? Mm. So you don't have to be always looking at dystopia. You can be looking at, at solutions. And maybe those solutions might create their own problems later down the line, but that's for another story. Elizabeth, when you're writing, do you think consciously about, about visions of the future that are more hopeful? Uh, I, I do. I mean, n nobody can compete with Paolo when it comes to depressing futures, so we just right. sort of let him have that <laughs> spot. <laughs> He's won that argument. That's, um, but one of the things that's very significant to me is that when we talk about utopia, for example, everybody's utopia is somebody else's dystopia. Mm -hmm. There's always somebody who's disenfranchised. There's always somebody whose vision of how the world should work isn't being expressed in that, quote, utopia, unquote. So the question is, is this a, is this a even in a you know, terrible Hunger Games future, there are people who are really enjoying their lives, who are um, the, the privileged, privileged class who are living off the labor of other people. So I think that one of the interesting things that fiction can do is look at the tension between those groups of people, the people who are invested in the system, uh, the people who want to destroy the system, and whether or not the system works and who it works for. Right. Yes, because I think that's one of the things science fiction does is it's ostensibly about the future, but it really is uh, it's really about human society in the present and how does, Very much so. how does our current society operate when you change the operating conditions? Mm -hmm. What remains constant about human beings? Yeah. Um, and so in that, in that vein, it can feel right now like we're in a, it, it feels right now like a very dystopian moment, a very apocalyptic moment for all sorts of reasons, political, climatic, um, and others. So um, how, do you think that, how do you think that fiction can, can play a role or can it play a role in shifting what the cultural narrative is around about where technology is going and, and about creating the imagination that, that better things are possible. I mean, one of the things that we can do very much so is uh, show technologies mitigating the effects of things like climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Boston is one of the cities that is very involved in 
proactively planning for climate change. We can show things like people using soft edge technology. I actually just finished a, a story uh, which is a murder mystery sort of accidentally solved by a plastic filtration system designed to create uh, uh, artificial wetlands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As you do. As you do, sure. You, bu you, build a, you build a system to filter microplastics out of the water and use it as a mesh, which can create a, a wetland that can be colonized by local life forms. And in so doing that, you also develop a really good picture of, for example, what local pollution patterns are, what you find where. So if you find, say, a dead body with a lot of water in the lungs, you can tell where the body came from. And now I've spoiled my story. You don't need to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so Marina, um, you've written a book, The Nature of the Future, which is about what you call a social structured, a social structured world. So tell us a little bit more about, about the ideas in that. Um, what I looked at in the book and what I wrote about is that we have this generation of technologies that have a lot of promise, the promise to connect, the promise to share, and it changes how we create things because these technologies enable something like Wikipedia where people are contributing, it has a platform, and the potential of that is enormous. But in the book, I actually created two, three scenarios, one of them utopian, and one of them sort of dystopian. One was that we are entering in this kind of commons-based new mode of production and things like Wikipedia and many other things where people are contributing, sharing data, sharing contributions of various kinds. That's a really um, interesting path and very positive path. But the other path was actually what I call digital feudalism, mm -hmm. which is where these platforms are basically, we're all contributing, we're all like peasants, you know, manor houses and feudalism. There were commons grounds where peasants used to, for various things, and grew crops and um, did various kinds of things, but they were not really paid for that, right? So there's a lot of analogies in our social media platforms today where we're all working for Facebook or Twitter. We're all contributing, you know, that's our time, that's our attention, and we're getting a lot back. We're getting social rewards, we're getting connectivity and all of that, but we're not getting paid for it. Somebody else is, and kind of unfortunately, there are two things happening at the same time, and when you think about the future, usually it's both things, or many things. If you look at scenarios, it's not one scenario that's going to win. It's going to be multiple different things coming out at the same time. Right, so what then ends up determining which way it goes, which direction it leans in? You know, what I find, having looked at technologies, and I think a lot of people, particularly I come from Silicon Valley, and in Silicon Valley, people think that technology decides everything. I don't know, probably here too in many ways, hopefully not. But I increasingly come to culture. It's our cultural norms and narratives that really shape how we use these technologies. I think technologies, they do have certain capabilities and inherent to them, like connectivity and others, but ultimately it's we humans that decide how these technologies are deployed, what is outside of the bounds of possibility and what's inside, what's that Overton window which when, within which we operate. And so to me, uh, you know, McLuhan, it's attributed to McLuhan, I'm not sure he actually said that, uh, but his phrase was, we invent our technologies and thereafter our technologies invent us. So it's a constant process of sort of co-invention. Um, and to me, now I feel like we're at the point where we need to look at, at culture and social norms and narratives as levers to deploy these technologies in a positive way. How do you think that those cultural, I and mean, this is for any of you, how do those cultural norms and narratives get rewritten? Or can you think of examples of science fiction or other fiction, actually, that has had a, a really singular effect on shifting a cultural narrative around, around the use of a technology, particularly? I, I think there are lots of different ways in which, for example, um, you know, I look a lot what's happening with work and the concept, even you know, the concept of wage labor is a relatively recent concept in human history, 200, 300 years, and now we can't think that there is a way to live without basically selling our time as a commodity. Mm -hmm. So something changed along the way, and it's not one thing, it's many different things. 
Uh, so we created norms around laziness and idleness, which were sins. You know, that didn't come from these technologies that came from the church and other places. So I think that these institutions and norms really shape how we deploy these technologies. Yeah. I, Go on. Oh. Either one of you. Karen, <laughs> Go ahead. Karen, no, just to say the point about history is so important because you're, you're talking about shifts in social norms. And I have to add in that we've also had shifts in scientific paradigms. And it's the same kind of thing where we are giving a structure, either a structure of this is how the universe is, is shaped or this is how the, the world works. And we think that that is it. But the reality when you examine history is that we are continually reshaping our concept of what is meant to be right or what is meant to work. And specifically when you're talking about the difference between fiction and history, the difference between fiction and history is, is very fun, uh, is, is, a, is a moving line mm -hmm. um, because history is a narrative mm -hmm. and history is a series of narratives and who is constructing the narrative has a really big impact on what we perceive as truth. Mm -hmm. And that narrative can change depending on who uh, who is in a position of power, who is telling the story, uh, whose experience is foregrounded in the story, whose is marginalized. Um, and one of the things that we've, we've learned to do in the last 100 years or so um, is through ideas of deconstructionism, moving the viewpoint around to see different perspectives and to create different narratives, um, which I think is, is you know, one of the 20th century's great contributions to human thought. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about a, a history that changes people's ideas of, or a narrative that changes people's ideas of, of how the world works, uh, bury my heart at wounded knee mm -hmm. comes to mind. Um, one of the books that really started changing people's ideas of, you know, what the American Indian experience was and, quote, how the West was won, unquote, um, and humanized people who had been dehumanized previously in American history. So, I mean, that's the power of narrative. The power of narrative is the ability to construct not just the past, but also the future. If we're looking in directions of constructing technologies that are usable in a practical, functional, everyday sort of way that don't require people to act in ways that people don't act, then we need to have that narrative of it's, you know, public transportation is not, uh, not déclassé, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want people to use public transportation, you have to make it easy and pleasant to use mm -hmm. and not a thing you do as self-punishment because it's virtuous or because you'd rather not drive in Boston. Um, I mean, okay, we'd, never, we'd rather not drive in Boston, but still. <laughs> How does either, either of you to think about um, when, you, when you're building a world and, you know, often the, the stories that you write are pretty fantastical. They're pretty, out, they're not like... Paolo's that are very closely hewed to the present day. They're, you know, they're space stories, and, and you know, one, one of the stories of Elizabeth that I was rereading recently, which is about um, a spaceship that actually evolved on, uh, in the high, high uh, atmosphere of Jupiter and is a living thing that flies between the planets. Um, so when you're thinking about the stories that you write, how are you, and you're building a world, how are you thinking about what are the, I guess, the social messages that you want to convey, and how does that play into the Ooh. sorts of things you write? Messages, that sounds kind of heavy, doesn't it? Uh. Yeah, it <laughs> um. Well, you want to not, you want to not valorize, you, you don't want to be, you know, Lanny Riefenstahl. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to valorize awful people doing awful things. You, you don't, but at the same time, I think it can be organic. I think if you just look at consequences, there are optimal up outcomes and there are suboptimal outcomes. You don't even have to get into the morality of it. You can be value neutral and just show, you know, this person being making bad choices at this particular time set off this entire chain reaction, and we wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? <laughs> so, so I, I think I think you do have to be careful because um, I, I wrote a short story recently where I used the word propaganda, mm -hmm. and um, and. <laughs> 
it's, it's an insult that sometimes has no meaning. Sometimes if somebody reads something which they don't agree with, they call it propaganda, mm -hmm. and, that, and it becomes a valueless word. But at the same time, you do have to think about how organic is that message? Is it, is it coming from the roots of, okay, we can trace back um, the results to these particular actions and see that these are actions that are suboptimal? Or is it you coming in with a, a value system and saying, I'm going to put this value system onto this it's fabricated world. Or organic versus didactic. Yes, yes. Um, and there is some great didactic literature out there. Um, but and how well is it going to age? I don't know. Well, Brave New World <laughs> comes to mind. Um, it's. I think that had more consequences in mm -hmm. some ways, yeah. But it's, there's definitely, I think there's definitely a, a, Aldous Huxley has a viewpoint about mind control, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess we're never completely innocent yeah. of, of what we put in. Even when we're trying to just focus on consequences, there's always going to be our own beliefs slipping in there. Well, because part of, part of creating an interesting story is make, giving your character ethical choices to make. Exactly. And what's, what's interesting, I think if you're doing it right, I mean, right is also a value judgment, mm -hmm. right? But um, if you are doing it in an even-handed fashion and not attempting to write a polemic or a didactic piece, what winds up happening is that often you will get emails from people who t t came to exactly the opposite conclusion about what was ethical and what wasn't that, yeah. that you did while you were writing the story. Like Clockwork Orange. Like Clockwork Orange, yeah. yeah. And, and in that sense, it's really important whose visions of the future and who's imagining, who's participating in creating those dreams. Right. Because a lot of times these visions of the future in the past have come from certain places and a lot of voices have been excluded from that. Uh, you know, Alvin Toffler, before he published Future Shock, he wrote this essay called uh, Future of the Way of Life where he really talked about how it has to be a basically a literacy and something that everybody has can participate in because these visions of the future and our expressions of them do shape what we ultimately create and what we aspire to and our moral and ethical precepts that we follow. So it's really important we, at, at the Institute we talk about the future has to be massively public. Mm -hmm. We have to engage a lot of people in this conversation. Yeah. I was having a conversation last night with a friend about what Silicon Valley could do to combat climate change. And he said, wouldn't it be amazing if Facebook started doing things like um, showing you every time one of your friends was affected by a climate-related or supposedly climate-related natural disaster. Um, or if um, it, you know, in other words, a social network like Facebook could provide all sorts of nudges that would cause people to take action on climate. Now, leaving aside the, whether that would be even politically feasible for Facebook to do, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's a vision in which both in which the tech and a tech platform gets e even more awesome power, which is something that we're not necessarily sure we want, um, but potentially because it indeed exists, that power could have a very positive effect. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of, I mean, is, and, and I, I suppose the, the reason is, the reason I bring it up is, regardless of what you think of that particular scenario, it's an example of thinking about something that we would think of as completely impossible in our current climate, but that could have a major effect on, on, on a problem like climate change if it were to happen. Um, yeah. So what am I really asking? I guess I'm asking, what is <laughs> Can Silicon Valley fix climate should, change? Should, <laughs> should, well, not should, can it, but should that sort of, is that, is that the kind of thing that science fiction should be trying to encourage? I, I actually kind do believe thinking. that climate change is one of those issues. I, I was talking to an economist and he compared, it's a moral issue. And mm -hmm. once we grapple with it as a moral issue, so mm -hmm. he compared it to slavery. So, you know, we had a whole economy that was dependent on slavery. Right. And there was a moral imperative to get away from that, right? Mm -hmm. And it was hard to do, and it required some transition. It wasn't easy, and we still probably are feeling effects of it. But it's kind of similar. We had an economy that was dependent on an asset mm -hmm. 
that was slaves, right? right? We have an economy that depends on this asset, and ultimately, I do think it's a moral issue that we need to tackle. Uh, and the, and the asset in this case is consumer capitalism, basically. Well, or fossil fuels. Yeah. Our economy is dependent on this asset. But it's, it's not just fossil fuels. It's having to have a new phone every two years. <laughs> right? Ultimately going back. Yeah, to it's, it's, it, it's, um, it's having to have a new car every two or three years. It's, right. it's having whatever fresh vegetables you want at any time of year. Exactly. Yeah. So these but, are basically some old, old problems that we have never really faced. Yeah, but it's is, so. Is it a moral problem, or is it a? It's also a question of I think again imagination, the the ability to believe that actually, yes, our you know just as it was, yeah. it might have seemed inconceivable to some people that the economy could have functioned without slavery. Mm -hmm. Why why is it so hard to believe that the economy could function without all of these creature well, comforts? I think part of the reasons is because there were other places where economy did exist without slavery, so there were examples to follow, mm -hmm. and. Um, we don't have a lot of examples. I think examples are beginning to kind of propagate, but there are not that many. So we need to create these examples and prototypes and all of those things. But um, the other thing is, I do think that we need to change messaging around climate change. I was just at an event and somebody said, you know, Martin Luther King didn't come to us and say, I have a nightmare. He came in and said, I have a dream, right? right? So this is the messaging we need to go to. What is our dream? Who, can, who has that dream? And how do we basically change that? I, I think that there's a, a, a cultural shift. And it's a cultural shift that, that occurred, at least in the US. I don't have a, a wide enough knowledge of economics to, tell, to discuss the rest of the world. But occurred in the US around and after World War II, the idea that we needed to have growth. We needed to have inflation. Mm -hmm. um, that that and and I I have a theory that this has to do with sort of the the turning of the ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union not into a conflict between uh, freedom of choice and uh, dictatorship and totalitarianism, but communism and capitalism. Like I think that entire framing mm -hmm. became a sort of religious issue. And now we have this idea that capitalism is good. Capitalism is an economic system. <laughs> <laughs> it has no moral element. Um, it is a useful economic system. But it's not the only way to do things. And constant forced growth is not the only way to do things. So I think we need to make an ethical shift to considering sustainability and making basically making sure that everybody is taken care of in a sustainable fashion, um, we need to start valorizing that, which is actually something that fiction can do. Hey, <laughs> look at that. I came full circle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, so fiction can valorize that. But then how do we take it further? How do you make it part of the broader consciousness? I mean, this is maybe where you come in, Marina, because <laughs> you're sort of slightly more at the sharp edge of this, right. these things. I think people. you're right. We're kind of at a, in an ideological vacuum right now. Yeah. You know, We kind of ended Keynesianism, ended in the 70s with stagflation, low growth. Then we had neoliberalism, created growth in 1990s and until now. And, but created a lot of inequality and horrible climate outcomes. So now, what comes now? And I think this is the place for imagination. And actually, for me, where I go is that there are a lot of hidden economies that are kind of, we don't talk about. You know, there are things like co-ops. There are things like local uh, community trust. There are Native American ways of doing where morality is embedded, economy is not its own separate thing, operated on its own. So I actually look at a lot of these, what we call hidden economies. Like how do people live in very different ways? Family businesses whose goal is to sustain the family, not have exactly. a huge IPA and make billions right. of dollars. Or distributive enterprise that distributes assets and distributes in a very, very different way. And so they're on the margins now. At some point, they were the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Right, so I often, often feel like I'm as much as a historian as I'm a futurist because going back in history, the problem with future thinking is that um, we tend to think that our lifetime, like th these are the way things should be, 
and there is no other way to do things. And when you go back in history, it kind of expands your imagination, and you go, people did look very, uh, live very differently. So right. it's going from history to how did we get here, and then gives you more ideas for the future. And then the implication of that is that we have to go backwards to get to that, that way of, of doing things in the past, but history moves forwards. Yeah, you know, Thomas Pynchon in uh, Gravity's Rainbow, one of his characters, I love this, he had this concept of temporal bandwidth, which is, he said that if, in order to be a resilient person, you need to connect history to the present to the future. And the people who are most resilient are people who are able to understand how did we get here? We didn't just appear. These things don't appear just appear. There's something that got us here. So connecting that history to the present, to the future, mm -hmm. is a really good practice. And I think that is um, what you've just mentioned is a very strong element of speculative fiction, especially with the Caribbean. We're always, you know, they like to, to differentiate between science fiction and fantasy, where science fiction is more about the future or alternate present, and fantasy is some alternate world which is sort of almost medieval. Mm -hmm. But for us, you, you cannot really deal with the future unless you deal with the past, and they're always connected. There's so many books and stories I've read where there is always that look back to the elders' lives and the look forward to what your descendants will be facing. Um, so I think that is an extremely important point. Right. What would you like to write that would give us a more inspiring uh, vision of this planet's future? Uh, I, I actually... Um, uh, I have a, a novella uh, that I wrote several years ago called uh, In the House of Ariyama and a Lonely Signal Burns, um, which is about a, uh, it's another murder mystery because I like a lot of, I like murder mysteries and I write a lot. It's set in a, a climate conscious future Bangalore mm -hmm. um, and the technologies are all background. Um, and that's, that's the sort of thing that I enjoy writing on that front. Mm -hmm. Karen? Um, I, I want to, and this is going to take a lot more research, I want to find new models of citizenship and governance to put into some of my fiction. Mm -hmm. Because even as I attended sessions earlier with both immigration and refugees and so on, I am not sure if I am personally comfortable as, as a researcher in sociology about how we have um, hardened the borders of statehood yes. um, and, and made, made things, I mean, as historically, again, we have been so accustomed to moving about. It's really how we became what we are. And now we're at this point of almost stagnation. I do think it's time to examine what we can do. I mean, far future science fiction is, is usually planet Earth is your citizenship. You know, it's, it's a global thing. So I am looking at a manuscript, which I am supposed to live by the end of the year, um, <laughs> which um, there's actually an imperative on us to, to drop statehood and become you know, citizens of Earth before we can participate in a higher government which will be galactic. Right. And I wonder what would push us to that point and how we could accomplish it. So I'm very much still working that out. Very good. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, but thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.